a bit about me. Um, our, our great moderator already told a lot about me. Uh, do follow me on Twitter. I, I write in English only, so uh, and I I do talk about IT security quite a lot. So I've been doing IT security for uh, more than 10 years. As has been said, network flow, na flow analysis is where I come from. Uh, that is why this talk here is about uh, the vulnerability specifically in the internal network. It's not IP, it's this Combus. Uh, Combos thing uh, for the system, but in the future I look forward to hacking the system even more and looking at some other protocols that it uses as well. And I also do legal stuff. So I mean, I got a bit bored with the technical stuff. I've been doing technical stuff altogether for like 20 years, I think. Well, 18 years, uh, and and I've started doing paperwork in IT security. So that's that's also fun. So, what do we have here on on the table today? Um, we have a security system made by a Canadian company called uh, Paradox Security, and they make modular security alarms. So that means you can expand them. Usually when you install a security alarm in your house, a company comes and installs the system. You don't do it yourself. But what they can do, they can offer you, like, you want a keypad, you want 10 keypads, we can do that. Uh, you want sensor, you want the more sensors, what kind of sensors. So they do that. Um, they make them. And there are three types of security alarms that they make. One is Spectre SP, those are the entry level alarms, uh, basically expandable security systems, what I just talked about. Uh, the second thing is uh, EVO, which is high security access system. So those are the ones where you actually have more security built in, at least according to their marketing department, and uh, where you can you know, feel a bit more secure uh, from technical level. And finally, the third one is Magellan, uh, which is uh, wireless security systems. I really look forward to into looking into those, because uh, I mean, I think wireless you know, is a holy grail this year, these years. You can uh, basically hack anything, because it's all available. So I want to also acknowledge some prior research. Um, uh, Martin Herzanov has done some, some stuff, and uh, Gittis Romanowskis, who's from Lithuania, which is a neighboring country to Latvia, has also posted some code on GitHub. Uh, but they have worked on different aspects of that, um, of, of these systems, right? Like serial protocol or the, <coughs> the Combus protocol on the SP series, which is the low security series. So here we're going to be talking about Combus on this EVO mm, level on the high security series. And I do re responsible disclosure, as was told, at least I try. Uh, as, as good as I can. So <clears throat> I have a slide about how it went with, with Paradox Security here. So at first, uh, when I contacted them, I got basically a general claim that, you know, we, we don't have any bugs, go away. Uh, we, we don't want to talk to you. Uh, <clears throat> and, and what was funny at that point was, uh, I mean, I, you, know, you know, some of you probably do security research. So I contacted the company. I tried to found, find uh, a contact point. You don't just send an email to info at company with, with all the wound specs, right? So I told them, well, I found this vulnerability. You can kind of uh, learn the security codes in use on the system. Um, and they said, thanks, we're going to look into that. <laughs> and, and I clarified that I want to talk to some from, someone from the security department uh, to, to give more info. And then it took some time, and, and uh, you know, they got me, like they forwarded some of my emails. Uh, so. I learned that clearly the company at that time didn't have proper responsible disclosure security process uh, in place. Um, so in a few months, I got a response saying information has been dealt with, whatever that means. Um, and the funny thing is that at no point I actually got to send them a proof of concept, because they never asked. I mean, I, I, like the first email they forwarded to the security guys, that was it. Like th then they said information has been dealt with, and, and I inquired, so is it, is it OK? Is it, is it fixed? And they basically said, for obvious security reasons, blah, 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 we're not commenting any further. So, OK, sure. Uh, I gave them you know, some more time uh, to make sure, because hardware systems are notoriously hard to update, right? Uh, for example, the hotel lock doors, right? Vulnerability that was exposed more than five years ago, I think. Um, I'm staying at a hotel right now that has that, that terrible door where you can just plug in a magic marker and it opens up. Um, I didn't test it though, but I don't feel too safe there. Anyway, so that's uh, for the responsible disclosure process. Let's look at some of the components for the system. Uh, you're going to see a keypad, of course, but some of the components I just want to get out of the way. Um, but if you are into this kind of things, you can take take a deeper look. You can research it yourself. So um, the basic part, well, except the main 
panel, of course, are these zone interrupt devices. Very simple devices like, like this passive infrared sensor here or, or these magnetic sensors here. All they do is they provide a one or a zero in an electrical way, right? They change the resistance on the wire and the panel can see that. So they're one way. Then there are PGM modules or programmable output modules, and they are the opposite way, right? You, you can drive a relay, you can drive a small LED uh, from the PGM port, and you can create a small program like um, a small list of assumptions, and when they're true, then PGM port goes off. Um, then there are serial devices, which is what uh, some of the guys doing research previously on Paradox were looking into. So there's a serial port on, on there, and you can use, for example, this converter to convert it into proper uh, standard serial that we're all um, ready to work with instead of uh, RS-485. And there are different ancillaries, like, you know, you need a battery, probably you need the alarm to, to make the noise when someone breaks into the, the building, right, and so on. Uh, now, and this is about Combus, which is a common protocol between the other devices, like the smart, well, n not smart devices in, in how we, in the sense that we use it today, but the a bit smarter devices and the panel. So those are Combus slaves, and they provide two-way communication. Here we have an example of a printer, printer module. We can see that we have, um, we have the parallel port for a printer, we have serial port for a printer, and we have a USB port uh, for a printer, and we can connect it via the Combus module uh, over here and then you can print to your printer from your security alarm. That's an official module made by them, um, if you need such a thing. And of course, keypads. Keypads is what, is what it's all about. Um, you also connect them via Compass. Now finally, before we look deeper into uh, specific parts of the motherboard, yeah, there is, of course, the motherboard. This is, I, this is from the Spectra model. That's the entry-level model, right? That's, that's how it looks approximately. But here today, what I have is a system with the secure model, is the Evo 192, which is the um, most expensive of the non-wireless models, right? And I'd like to talk a bit about what we see here uh, on the slide. So first of all, there are different power sources, of course. Uh, we power it with a transformer from mains. We feed it 16.5 volts. There are two more power so sources, of course, the battery, because the bad guys usually, well, the smart bad guys, what they do, they cut the power first, and then uh, they break into your stuff. Uh, and of course, we have the small battery for real-time clock. It's just three volts just to keep the clock intact when everything else goes to hell. Um, and Combus. This is what the talk is going to be about. So Combus consists of four wires here. Uh, and you also have a possibility to neatly connect to Combus when you are at the panel. So you plug in a short, uh, a, a simple, uh, simple connector, and you also get Combus access. But this is this is the holy grail here that we're talking about today. Uh, we have some more ports like Serial RS-485 that I already mentioned. Uh, we have Memkey port, which is a fun thing. So apparently they also make these USB drives. On one side, you have USB port, which you can plug in your computer. On the other side, you have something that goes into this port here. And you can plug it in and copy the configuration of the device or onto the device, which is kind of cool. And it deserves some more research, but I'm not looking forward to spending more money on, on, on this. So if someone wants to, that's, that's the way to go. That's something you might be interested in. And it also a voice dialer uh, connection, which is uh, not too relevant, but you can basically dial a voice number when something happens instead of uh, letting your security company know. So how do they go about reverse engineering step by step? So you can follow along and you can also repeat this to validate the research or do some reverse engineering of your, on your own um, for some other stuff. I used basically two hardware tools, um, logic analyzer. Well, to be fair, I did start with a digital oscilloscope, but, but logic analyzer would have worked just as well. And Arduino Uno, which is what I'm going to be using today to actually um, read the data on the Compass. So here's an overview of how Compass works. Even though I present you it to you here for, for an overview, I got to this as the last piece of the research. Right After I have gone through everything else, I could actually draw these. Uh, but for an overview, so Compass, as I said, are four wires. There's a common line. You connect to the monitors, the panel, and you have a bunch of slaves. You can connect up to many. I don't remember. I think it's 63. Uh, Combus slaves to a panel, um, and I also created this neat overview, kind of like levels, right? Some of you may be familiar with ISO, um, ISO OSI 
uh, level for networking, like seven networking layers. Uh, here are the compass layers. I just created them out of nowhere because uh, that's how I see it, and that's how it's easier for me to structure uh, the thing. So we have electrical layer where we talk about how signal is uh, formed, how it looks on the wire. Uh, we have signal level uh, where we talk about um, checksums and stuff like that. Then we have packet where we see how the packet looks. We have the command level, which is different kind of commands that you can have, and payload, which is kind of like the uh, representation uh, for different encodings that the payload can have. Right, so to get to that, we have our panel right um, right here, and we have four wires going out of it, and if we take a look at the keypad, we have four wires going in on the other side. So the question is, how do we communicate to it, and how do we understand which wire is which? So, here's our keypad, right? You let, Let's say, you're a good guy, you're doing research, and you have the system installed in your home or, or in a company that you own. You take the keypad off the wall, you take a look at it, and this is what you see. You basically see a bunch of connectors with wires going in. And these are the actual markings on the keypad. It says yellow, green, black, red, PGM, and zone. So nothing much there. Um, zone is obviously the term used for security zones, which means it's just for the sensor. And you might have a wire going there or not. Yellow, green, black, and red you will always have because those are mandatory four wires for the COMBUS. Now, how, to, how do we go about reverse engineering it? Well, we use, first of all, we identify where the COMBUS is, right? You will have these four wires going in there uh, from the panel, and this, these two wires will actually go to the sensor that is near our keypad, typically installed for the door sensor. Well, we use a multimeter, right? We, that's a handy tool that we can use. We start probing, we start with black one, right? Black one is usually ground, so we need to verify that. Uh, so we use one probe on ground, the other one we put into the black connector, and we see that resistance is zero, so they're connected most likely, so black one is ground. We've done that. Well, now red one is usually voltage, so we plug our multimeter into black and red, right? And what we see is we have a stable DC voltage, stable direct current, and that means red is power, so let's not mess with those. Now we have two wires remaining yellow and green. We plug our multimeter in there and yeah, we don't, we don't see anything much. We see like some fluctuations. The voltage is kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, so a multimeter isn't gonna cut this here. So what we do, we use a logic analyzer. We connect the logic analyzer to red, oh, sorry, to <laughs> not red, of course, uh, to green and yellow wires uh, with a common ground of black and this is, this is what we see we immediately see a nice, nice picture, right? This logic analyzer, that is why it's so neat. On oscilloscope, we would, of course, see it a bit more, um, a bit more analog, right? But here's, we can see it quite neatly. So we see the uh, green one and the yellow one here. So what we can ascertain from this picture is that yellow one is clock, because we always have one zero, one zero, one zero. So we have no data on there, at least for the samples that we gather for now. And of course, that leaves green to be data because we see some, some different patterns in the green one over there. What we can also learn on the signal layer here is that there are 40 milliseconds between packet bursts, as evidenced by the millisecond uh, dimension there. And one clock cycle is one millisecond, which obviously means the signal is one kilohertz, which we again measure by, for example, the clock cycle here, top, bottom, here we have, here we have it. That is um, one millisecond. So we will need that data to build a device to actually interpret the signal and get out binary and hex data out of the bus. So, if we zoom in, this is what we see. This is one packet burst. Uh, we can see some interesting things happening here, like for example, clock kind ends here, but we still have data, but that's basically just zero for the clock there. So, if we take a look at it carefully, we see that data only happens when the clock is low, right? So, um, here for example, Right, we see that when the clock is high, we always have one on the data bus, which means there's no data being carried in there. Um, so when clock is low, we can read the green line and we see the data. We see like a bunch of ones and zeros in there and we can get the actual packet out of there, which is cool. So we get a packet, we don't know what it means, but we have a packet, so that's great. But we also should have two-way communications, right? Combus is a two-way communication protocol. You need to be able to type in your pin code on your keypad. You need to be able to get the information back from the panel, right, when some alarms are happening. 
So that means that something is missing. Now, long story short, looking at it a bit and, and typing some data on the keypads, what I found out is when clock is high, then slave is talking, and when clock is low, master is talking. Right? And we, we're using pull-down principles here, so when slave wants to talk, they pull down to send one. So in the previous example here, slave was not saying anything. That's why it was all ones. Right? So that's how it looks. Um, yes. Um, OK. There we go. So when we decode, now we are able to decode packets both ways, right? Clock is always provided by the master, and we have slave replying, asking for permission to talk and replying. Wow, that's a lot of people coming in. Uh, OK. So we can take a look at the packet structure. Let's take a look at some sample packets that are coming from master. For example, this one here. What we were able to understand is that um, master packet starts with a command number, and there are different command numbers. Basically, it's one byte. Then we have some data, then we have checksum, and then there is unused byte in the end. Um, I think the unused byte in the end is there because, um, because master is simply allowing the client to send back one last byte uh, if, the, if it wants to, but it never uses the last byte here. So we have different kinds. So this one, uh, number 40, that is response from the master saying if action succeeded or not, and giving some more data. Uh, the one that's starting with E something, um, that is, um, sorry, yeah, E is event. Uh, e is event, that is when an event happens, like a zone is triggered. Uh, zero C is uh, ping, basically, heartbeat. We're going to take a look into it in some more detail. Now, for communication from the slave to the master, it's a bit different. Um, the first byte is unused. That may be because of tolerance, right? The slave may not be fast enough, and it may not hear the clock uh, on time. That's why the first byte, in my opinion, is unused. Then we have channel request, which is always 0, 2, and then we actually have the command, right? So here are, um, here are some examples of that. Uh, checksum is easy. Checksum is basically we sum all the bytes and we in modules, modules 100 in hex, and we get the checksum. And we start always at the yellow byte, so we don't count these two in there. So looking at some commands. Um, this is a hard blit call, call command, one example. 0C, A8, 10, 11, which basically means this is packet, packet number uh, AA. And we are sending information that the date is uh, 16th, and hour is um, 17. So hour is 17. And this packet is used for two reasons, uh, either to set date and hour or minutes and seconds, depending on if this one is even or odd. Now, but that's not, not too much fun. Even though this is a packet that is sent the most, because it's also used as a heartbeat packet, uh, we are more interested in code entry. Right, so here is a code entry sample packet. And what I immediately saw when I was doing testing is that the numbers I press on the keypad kind of appear in, in the dump there. Not always, but sometimes they did appear. So I thought it, I thought it warrants some further investigation. So this is what I found. Uh, we have <coughs> user type there. So if it's one, that is pro one. If the first bit is one, it's a programmer. If not, it's a normal user. We have code type, and we have the code. Right, and we have the serial number of the device, which is also cool. So there is some authentication in place. It looks for a trusted source, even though it's like a MAC address in a Ethernet network. Right, you can simply fake it. So and the checksum, of course. Now looking at the payload, no encryption is used on any of the payloads that I encountered on this high security EVO system. Text often appears as fixed length ASCII strings using spaces as fillers, as in this example here. Numbers are packed binary coded decimal, and they have obfuscation. So if you type a zero, it sends an A instead of a zero. So that's, that's basically their encryption offer uh, for these high security systems. So at least we have that. Right, uh, let's do the fun part. So official user manual, sorry, installer, installer manual says that before you connect the module to the COM bus, you need to remove AC and battery power from the control panel. Uh, we don't have time for that today, so we're going to skip that part. Um, OK. <coughs> right, so this is um, control panel. Uh, sorry, I mean a keypad. You can type in some numbers, and stuff will happen. Like, you can type in an access code, and it will say that it's a bad access code, right? 
So what a bad guy might do is a uh, bad guy might take a look where your wire is going, right? So, and might make a careful cut in the wire and access your teeny tiny wires on there. Oh, I can zoom it, huh? Nice. <laughs> <coughs> cool. So then the bad guy might take a device and uh, try to see what's on there. Mm, I can't see. I can't show you both at the same time. Um, that's okay. I'm gonna switch between them. So, for the demo, I'm gonna show you. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take simply uh, simply a terminal um, application, and this is stuff coming in from my code running on the Arduino. Mm, just zero. So basically, the wires are are loose. They are not grounded. So we may also see some random bytes on there. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect this nicely to the device without disturbing the device operation. And if something happens, you might see, you might hear an alarm or you might hear uh, some beeps, but hopefully not. Hopefully we're gonna be stealthy enough to be able to do that. So we look at the wires here, we cut them up just a bit, and then we try to connect to, to the wire. Okay, I think I got ground. Let's, let's try to get clock right now. Okay, I may or may not have gotten clock, and let's let's try to get the data line. This is a green one. Okay then. So, if we take a look <coughs> at what's coming out of our Arduino right now, we see data, right? We see um, the master command, and we see the slave command, and we see some longer commands as well from time to time. Now, but that's not fun, right? It's hard to understand. So what we can do is instead of looking at this from a terminal like that, we can actually take a Python script that processes that stuff. Why not, huh? <coughs> so there we go. Now it, uh, it uh, looks on the wire and it <laughs> looks at the data live. So uh, we can actually see what's happening in there. And if something happens, like if someone goes and opens a door, we can also see the door being opened right over there, but there's a lot of, lot of timestamps going through, so I'm just gonna modify the script real quick to remove the, these, these uh, timestamp messages and relaunch it. That way, we can, that way we can enjoy a nice silence here. Um, now, if we open a door, or let's say we move in a room, we can see stuff happening, right? And we close the door, and then we stop moving. Um, oh yeah, and CRC is also checked here. So the fun part happens when the attacker comes and tries to guess the code, right? Like, let's do it seven, eight, nine, zero. Okay, so the attacker sees the code being typed, typed in and what is cool, the attacker also sees the reply. So even if the code is wrong, the attacker does not, is not misled that that's a valid code. Um, that's cool, huh? If we type the right code, then of course uh, it's also gonna work. Now, but that's not fun, right? This device is right here. This is where attacker tapped. What happens if this is like a dormant keypad that's just standing somewhere on the edge of your huge warehouse and no one uses it for like a month in a row? And you just use these shiny keypads over here. And you come to work, you enter your um, arming code, right? On this keypad and you're super safe, but the attacker <laughs> The attacker is connected there uh, on that device over there. So you still get it, uh, even though 218 is obfuscated as 2A18, uh, 2A18 on the wire, we defeat the encryption and <laughs> see it uh, right here. Right, so what else can we see? Oh, it got canceled. So we, see some, we can see some more um, shiny stuff. So for example, um, some of the systems here also have remotes which I bet are super secure since it's a high security system. Uh, I haven't tested the remotes yet, but I'm gonna do that for some next conferences, so stay tuned. Uh, but the point being, it's, it's wireless, you see that, right? If I press a button, let's say I lock the system, it also still you know, sends the message through the Combus, and you can still see that happening, so that's probably not good, right? And if, I, if, some, if someone you know, comes through the door now, trips the wire, then we get a situation here and uh, we can still unlock it from this, this remote here and nothing has happened, right? So, that's a demo. Uh, let's move on to conclusion slides then. So,
So exploitation scenarios. I already mentioned the so-called warehouse scenario. This is where you have a huge building, you have multiple keypads, and some of them, or one of them, are unused. Attacker can locate this unused keypad, can connect a device like this to it, and can just wait for the right codes to be posted. In a different scenario, if we change the setup a bit, we can also pull down the slave time slots. And by pulling down the slave time slots, we can guess the pin code, right? If we have a device that just Standing there on the wire, we can we have all the time in the world, right? If the lockdown is, let's say, five wrong pin codes per 30 minutes, we can go three pin codes per 30 minutes, which is six pin codes per hour. With enough time, we can still find the right code, right? So those are two kinds of attacks that I should be, I think, people should be especially worried about. Now, in summary, um, I built some hardware, I wrote some software. Mm, it's going to be available, so play around. Um, I partially trans transcribed the protocol. So what you didn't see in the demo, uh, there are also some unknown messages that I haven't classified yet um, that go that get passed back and forth. But uh, I mean, it's it's relatively easy to classify those. Now solutions are an important part of security research, of course, especially when doing offensive security research. And solutions I'm offering here, they are a bit um, over 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 the top, maybe, right? Um, in a sense that you might go for a simple, so simpler solution, but then with the devices becoming more and more powerful and actual high-powered processors becoming smaller, I think this is the way to go, because if you implement your own crypto, you get something like that. Uh, so encryption is the common layer. My proposal is TLS. Why not? I mean, if the device is powerful enough, and these devices are usually powered through IC, uh, so transport layer security might be something you can use already. Uh, just put a certificate authority in trust store on all the devices and and it works, right? And there's an added benefit, you know, for the commercial department at Paradox Security. You can limit the CA life to like 10 years and then you have to buy an upgrade. <laughs> <coughs> um, then we need mutual slave master authentication. So uh, the first part will only protect against sniffing attacks. It wouldn't protect against someone trying to guess the pin code with an automatic device. So we need authentication both ways. What we can do is client certificates. Again, quite easy. Just ship every device with a certificate, and it's signed by the CA, so either it's a legit device or not. Um, and finally, sensitive payload encryption. So the payload should be encrypted adi in addition to TLS if implemented, because you know there is some sensitive stuff like, I don't know, pin codes that you wouldn't want attacker to get. Uh, we can use unique pair panel key, for example, which is in the panel, and when installer comes to your house to install the system, they can just press the magic buttons and syn synchronize the keys between the devices and your panel or the motherboard. Now, there is some further research that I look forward to doing, uh, anti-collision protocol. So we have multiple keypads. What happens if multiple keypads send information at the same time? There must be some anti-collision built in. That's something I'm going to look into. Denial of service attacks. Can we just kill the system and get on with the robbing? I mean, not we, but you know, some bad guys. Uh, emulating a slave, just mentioned that. Compass over radio. So for Magellan systems, which are wireless, do they just use the same protocol over the radio channel, or do they encrypt it? That's the question there. Radio frequency attacks. So can we take a look? And of course we can. We just need time and incentive. But can we take a look at this, and can we see what's happening there? Do we have some encryption, or do we have like just plain text, or, or maybe rolling code? And firmware reverse engineering is something I'd like to take a look at. Just dump the firmware of the panel. Maybe there's cool stuff on there. So slides will be available in like one hour on kiros.org. And uh, tools will be available in two days on this site over there. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be around. Thank you.